This is uh, a tool a talk on ESML tool. My name is Klaus Zimmermann. Uh, of course, the tool is being developed, as you will see shortly, by uh, a rather a large number of people and many organizations. So uh, this is a little bit the overview of what I want to talk to you about today. Um, that is, I will first give a brief introduction, uh, then uh, give a short technical overview so that we can understand how the tool works and how usually as a user we use it. Um, and then we talk a little bit about available data sets and also available diagnostics. Now let me start with a teaser. These are just some figures from ESMVAL tool that show its capability to do a routine evaluation of Earth system models. Here you see the surface temperature anomalies as uh, captured by the CMAP5 model with some significant uh, events uh, from volcanoes highlighted. Um, and we also have some uh, biogeochemistry uh, diagnostics for the ocean, as well as some um, diagnostics that may be more interesting for those of you who are working in the impact sector or that are more downstream users of ASML tool, like this uh, capacity factor calculation for uh, wind turbines. We'll come back to some of these diagnostics later on. Okay, um, let's start then with the introduction. Uh, a brief uh, look to the past. Uh, Isambalto really has uh, some history by now. Um, it all started with this CCM Val Dyke tool that had a different name and it was a little bit different. Um, but this was the first tool where uh, we had a shared evaluation of chemistry climate models in this case. Um, and the fundamental idea of having one tool that allows to do the evaluation across different models um, first originated there. Uh, and this was already in 2012, um, so 10 years ago now. Um, and this was followed up later on then by ESM Val tool version one, the last release of which was version 1.1 in 2017, where these ideas were extended to um, Earth system models. And um, both tools were really laying the groundwork for this new approach of uh, evaluating Earth system models uh, across the board. Um, but both of those were written in NCL, the NCL programming language. And uh, as complexity and volume of data in newer Earth system models increased, it was found that uh, these tools struggled to keep up with the performance requirements. So um, it was decided to rewrite the tool. And um, this is what we're working with now, uh, the version 2.0 was a complete rewrite of the tool really in Python. And it performs very well. Uh, and we have now since version two, uh, also a regular release interval. So that we have uh, about three releases. No, not about, we have three releases per year. And um, here you can see an overview over the releases since version 2.0 and some of the crucial um, improvements that have been integrated. Most recently, <clears throat> this is the automatic download of data. Uh, and um, in the very last released version, a uh, revamp of the support for observational data sets and the addition of monitoring capabilities. So this um, was version 2.5.0 that was released in March. And uh, the next version, 2.6.0, is in preparation right now.
So how does it work? What's the fundamental idea of ESM VAL tool? The basic idea is really to bring together model data and diagnostics and to recognize that uh, model data comes from diverse sources and we somehow need to uh, bring that under the same umbrella um, to allow an easy analysis with our custom diagnostics. Um, ISMBAL tool is mostly focused on uh, CMIP, that is the coupled models in the comparison project, uh, in which basically all climate um, models of the world are contributing to doing the same experiments. Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, starting from that um, databases, we, we perform from our diagnostics. Um, so as a standard tool in CMAP, and really then also for the IPCC report, ASM Power Tool gathers different diagnostics and making use of the uh, good model data uniformity in CMAP. <laughs> um, we can perform this uh, comparison analysis across models. To, to allow the full evaluation of our system models, this must be extended also to observations. And that is one of the um, big advantages that ESM Valtru brings, uh, that it supports observational data sets and brings them into a standardized form similar to um, the CMAP data for our system models. So how are these goals then uh, achieved exactly? Um, we, we support the model evaluation analysis and comparison by handling uh, a lot of the data. So ESM Vital tool can find data on its own and uh, feed it to the diagnostics. And uh, a huge part of the tool as well is uh, pre-processing that is a large number of standard analysis steps such as uh, regrading or level extraction, a calculation of spatial and temporal um, statistics are available as building blocks that can be put together in so-called recipes. And we'll look at that a little bit in a little bit more detail later on. And as I already said, by support for observational data sets. While we are focused on CMIP data, that is mostly CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, uh, we also have some support now for uh, CMIP 3 and also Cordex data. So CMIP, uh, I mentioned before, is the coupled model intercomparison project, which uh, brings together all the global climate models in the world. And Cordex, on the other hand, is the coordinated uh, regional effort where regional climate models or limited area climate models uh, perform the same experiments much in the same way uh, as global climate models do for CMIP. The advantage of these regional models over the global models generally is the much higher resolution, which also may be interesting for those of you who are interested in looking at regional aspects of uh, climate data. ESMVAL tool is developed as an open source project. And as such, we use the GitHub platform. Um, and the tool really is split up in two parts. One is the so-called ESMVAL core, or sometimes also just the core. And the other is the ESMVAL tool, sometimes only called the tool. And uh, this split was done so that um, we can focus on different aspects 
The ESMVAR core is generally developed by programmers or more experienced scientists with, with more experience in programming aspects. And it is focused on a very uh, stable and solid infrastructure on good performance and uh, generality. Whereas the tool is uh, generally developed more by scientists uh, that are focused on their individual diagnostics and want to get out scientific results. The two work together. The ESMVAR tool sits on top of the ESMVAR core and uh, makes use of all the uh, benefits of the, uh, the core. Um, for the more technically minded among you, I might say that uh, the ESMVAR core also has rather strict standards for code quality, including automated testing that uh, reaches above 90% coverage uh, for the code. As I mentioned in the beginning, this whole effort is very much a community effort. For the ESM bar core, we have contributions from the 63 uh, people in the repository for the ESM bar tool. Um, it's 72, though of course there is some overlap between the two groups. And we use issues on GitHub to uh, track outstanding problems and uh, their solution. And uh, as you can see, there are a number of issues open, but uh, more issues are closed. And um, yeah, this is a, an excellent way also to get in contact with the group. So if you have a question that we cannot address uh, in this webinar, or if you have a question later on when using the tool yourself, um, you're always welcome to go to our GitHub pages and to open a new issue or to open a new discussion to, to ask questions on, on how to achieve something or, or any question really related to the tool. The core itself is written purely in Python um, and is based on the um, general scientific Python stack, I would say, including NumPy, SciPy, and uh, Dask. <coughs> um, perhaps slightly unusual, uh, also strongly based on the Iris library, which is a library that supports uh, climate data that uh, is present following the so-called CF conventions. The tool, on the other hand, is also mostly written in Python, but we do support diagnostics written in other programming languages, namely NCL, R, and Julia. Um, in principle, one could add more languages here, but uh, of course, this always has to be balanced with the increased uh, maintenance effort that would come along with that. Okay. So I put here a reference to uh, the main description paper of the version 2.0. Um, if you want, you can look it up later on. Okay. Here I'm collecting a number of links. The first one is uh, to the main homepage of ESMBAL tool, where you will find uh, pointers to most of the other pages as well. Apologies. Um, and uh, then the second link here, uh, uh, labeled results, is a link to um, all the results of uh, ESM files who are produced with the latest version. Every time that we do a release, we also run all the recipes that are part of ESM file tool and um, put the results 
app uh, for, for viewing online. And this link here will uh, show you the results for the latest released version, version 2.5.0. And uh, in about a month's time, you will find at a similar location the results for version 2.6.0. The tutorial that I link to here is a software carpentry tutorial. That is, if you go to that web page, you can follow uh, the steps that are described there. And um, it takes you through the installation and the use of the tool uh, in a step by step way. So, if you want to use the tool yourself, that is an excellent way to, to do that. And if you're only interested in looking at the results, you can follow the previous link to these uh, latest results. Um, we also have rather extensive documentation, which you will find at this docs.esmbaltu.org webpage. And then I put here the links to the two uh, repositories on GitHub that I mentioned earlier. So the technical overview. Um, in this section, I will explain to you how the tool works, what happens when you do a run of the tool, um, and how everything uh, interacts together. This is uh, an overview of the, the schematic uh, workflow. Uh, and we see the things that, um, that play together here, really. Uh, do you see my mouse cursor? Not at the moment. Can you move? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, never mind. Then uh, I'll just describe it. So we have the input data, which generally is uh, data from models or observations. And then um, we have on the left side in the purple box uh, written this recipe, which describes what is supposed to be done. And at the bottom, uh, the red box shows the diagnostics. So the diagnostics are the scripts that do the specific analysis. And the recipe tells the ESMVAL tool how to combine the input data, the preprocessors, and the diagnostics to produce the output. And uh, what happens when you run the ESMVAL tool is that uh, it first reads the recipe, then finds the input data that is necessary, and then um, goes through the preprocessing. Um, the preprocessing is part of the ESMVAL core and is described in this large uh, box with a blue background and the yellow boxes inside of it. And um, these are some of the preprocesses that we, we have. There are a few more preprocesses uh, that are described in the, in the documentation. The, the preprocessing chain works as follows. The first step is the loading of the data. And then we have a variable derivation. Uh, this is the variable derivation is useful when you want to uh, use a variable that it can be calculated from the input, but is not directly available in the input. Some examples of those are, um, for example, uh, when you want to compare with uh, satellite observations where you only have an integrated version of an atmosphere variable that contains the data only for the entire column of the atmosphere, but your model data contains the uh, the data resolved vertically, then you can have a variable derivation that calculates the integrated version also for the model data um, for easy comparison. Another example is where um, the variable has been changed between CMAP5 and CMAP6, for example, some sea ice variables uh, and also some stream functions in the ocean have been changed and uh, this variable derivation allows us to calculate uh, to calculate them so that there's a comparison possible 
between the different generations of semen. Things like that. Um, then we come to CMOD check and fixes. In this step, we ensure that the input data follows the, the standards, the applicable standards from CMIP. And um, this includes uh, particularly fixes to any kind of model problems that we already know about. For example, some CMIP5 data has problems like uh, wrong units or um, some detailed problems with coordinates, things like that. And uh, whenever we come across something like that, um, we put a fix for it into the tool so that the author of a diagnostic does not have to deal with the peculiarities of every individual model, but can rely on the data coming into the diagnostic being standards compliant. Um, yes, so the next step then is uh, vertical interpolation where we uh, can extract data uh, or interpolate data vertically to different uh, levels. Then we have uh, support for masking, which allows us to compare data with uh, different masks and a very powerful um, preprocessor is the horizontal regrading that allows us to um, compare data that lives on different grids or regrid for other reasons. For example, you might want to calculate zonal means or things like that, uh, where you must ensure that the data um, is in a grid that is uh, in, in ordinary latitude and longitude. Um, recently, we've uh, extended this regridding functionality to also support uh, irregular uh, and unstructured grids. Um, we have some um, masking support for missing values. So the idea is that if you are looking at a time series and maybe there's only data for 80% or less of the uh, of a certain grid point that you then just mask the entire grid point. We have, uh, I was just speaking before about the masking of missing values. So how you can deal with the time series that have a lot of uh, missing values. Then the next thing that we have is time and space extraction. Um, that is uh, the extraction of, of regions of interest or of um, a time series that you're interested in. Um, then we have support for multimodal statistics and uh, then time and space statistics. And finally, unit conversion. And if all of this, uh, after all of this pre-processing, the result is stored in a NetCDF file, and uh, this file is then handed over to the diagnostic for uh, a processing. And the diagnostic uh, then produces generally three kinds of output. That is graphic files that contain plots and NetCDF files that contain the data and also provenance and uh, log files. So I suppose the plots and graphics is relatively clear. This is exactly what you, what you want to show in a paper, for example. Um, the NetCDF files, the idea is that um, basically what you show in a plot usually is some form of uh, process data that may include uh, all of the pre-processing here, but uh, it can, of course, also include uh, more extensive processing afterwards. And uh, we want to provide not only the graphics, but also the underlying data, and this is stored in the NetCDF files. 
um, the log files are mostly useful for understanding what exactly happened during the run of, of ASMVAL tool. Um, but the provenance is also interesting in that it really gives you an overview of what happened. So in the provenance, you will find all the information of which input data went into uh, um, uh, a plot or a data file and um, also which version of the tool was used to produce these files. Okay, so that's the, the overview of the workflow as a whole. Um, to recap briefly, when we run ESMVAL tool, it reads the recipe, uh, it uses the configuration to find the input data, and then preprocesses the input data, runs the diagnostic, and collects the output. So what does that look like in practice? Since, um, as I mentioned, all the information is basically in the recipe, uh, you, you generally edit the recipe, for example, to add a new model or uh, some other data set. Uh, and then you run the recipe by running ESMVAL tool, run, and then the name of the recipe. Here, the recipe can be one of uh, the recipes that come directly with ESMVAL tool. Um, in this case, you only need to give it the file name and it will run the recipe directly from inside uh, its own collection of recipes. Or you can give it a local file name. Um, if you have made a copy of a recipe and made some modifications, or if you have written your own recipe, you can uh, run that recipe without integrating it fully into the repository of ASMVAL2. Um, and then once uh, the run is complete, you will find the output of uh, this run in an output directory. And that can contain something like, uh, like this plot of uh, sea surface temperature uh, produced for the ECR3 model in this case. <clears throat> And I wanted to briefly uh, go into the configuration now. Uh, now it, it gets a little bit technical. So this is perhaps mostly for you if you are thinking of running the tool yourself. And I'm just taking a, a, a short uh, excerpt from the configuration file here, the user configuration config-user.yaml. Um, you will find many settings in that configuration file if you look at it. Here I focus on uh, three, download the offline and the root path. Let me start at the end. The root path tells ESMVAL tool where to find the data. Um, default is the category, is a catch-all category. So, any data that you try to use will be looked for in default. There can be separate root paths for CMAP3, CMAP5, and so on. And this is useful particularly when you're working on a big shared platform, such as uh, Jasmine in the UK or, or Siglat in France, uh, or the DKRZs, uh, Levant or Mistral computers, uh, where already large collections of climate data are available without the user needing to download any data. But if you are using the tool perhaps on your laptop or, or don't have access to such large uh, collections of climate data, uh, you can just download the data yourself. Or you can use the automatic download feature of ESMVAL tool. Uh, I think since version 2.4.0, we have um, automatic download of data from uh, the ESGF. The ESGF is the Earth System Grid Federation, which is the data storage arm, you could say, of uh, the CMAP project. And there you find, 
for download uh, all the data from CMAP 5 and 6, uh, as well as Cortex and some observational data sets. And since uh, this version of ESMVAL tool, uh, we have automatic download of this kind of data. And um, I'll explain in a moment how that works. So this was a quick look at the configuration. Now, um, let's take a look at a typical recipe. The recipe is a YAML file as well. Generally speaking, ESMBAL tool makes use of YAML, uh, which is this file format where you have uh, sections that are indented and uh, separated with uh, colons, and then you have lists and so on. Uh, so ESMVAL tool makes use of YAML throughout for configuration and recipes. And a recipe consists of four sections. Here you see the first section, the documentation section, which gives you at a glance the most important meta information, like a description, uh, a title, who wrote the recipe originally and who's maintaining it now, as well as um, on which paper is it based and uh, what project financed the development of this recipe. So this is all kind of bibliographical information, um, but of course it's always useful to have this kind of description. So that's the first section. Um, and now we're looking at the other three sections that really govern the execution of the tool. The other three sections are the data sets section, the preprocessors section, and the diagnostics section. Um, in the data set section, we specify what kind of a data set uh, we want to look at with this recipe. And the perhaps the most important uh, facets of this are the project one and the data set. So here you see two lines. The top one is from the CMAP6 project. So it's CMAP6 data. And the uh, second one is from CMAP5. And depending on the project, uh, different facets may be applicable. Uh, but all data set uh, lines um, contain a data set facet. For CMIP, this refers to the model. And uh, for observational data sets, it generally refers to the, the observational data set. Um, for these kind of climate model um, data sets, we then have the experiment. In this case, is the historical simulation. <clears throat> then the specification of the ensemble member. And uh, also here we have um, the, the time period that we're interested in. Here given as a start year and end year. And for the CMAP 6, you see also the special uh, key GRID, GN. Um, this was introduced in CMAP 6, where the models can upload their data either on their native grid or already regridded. Re -gridded. So some of the data, particularly from models with irregular or unstructured grids, uh, is available already on ESGF in a regridded form to make it easier to analyze. I should also say here the time period is given simply as start year and end year. Um, but since the last version of ESMVAL tool, I think, version 2.5.0, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have an extended support for, for the specification of um, time periods that allows you also to uh, have a higher resolution. So you can, for example, specify months that you're interested in or not interested in. 
And you can also uh, specify things like the last 20 years of a certain run or the first 10 months of a certain run. And this can be useful <clears throat> when um, the when the different data sets that you want to compare don't cover the exact same um, time period. Uh, which which may be because they genuinely cover different time periods, such as in the decadal uh, prediction business, or it may be because uh, the time axis doesn't reflect any kind of real time. For example, when you're doing long experiments with constant forcing. Right, so that's data sets. And generally speaking, what is involved through does, it is it applies the diagnostics from the diagnostic section uh, to all the data sets uh, that are listed in the data sets section. Um, so let me skip the preprocessor section for a moment and continue with the diagnostics section. There you have uh, this entry map. That's not a, a keyword or anything like that. It is an arbitrary name. And uh, under this section, then you have the description of that um, diagnostic. In this case, we see that uh, the, this map diagnostic is a global map of temperature in January 2000. OK. Um, we have some keys like themes and realms that allow us to classify the diagnostics and, and recipes. <clears throat> and then we specify the variables. Um, generally speaking, we always want to apply diagnostics to certain variables uh, which correspond to certain phenomena. In this case, TAS is the CMIP name for surface temperature. So we see that um, this diagnostic will be applied to surface temperature. And then uh, we have a few more details for that variable. Namely, it says here yeah, the MIP, or I should say CMIP table, RMON, that's for atmospheric monthly. And that tells us that we're looking at monthly means of surface temperature. Um, and then here we have preprocessor select January. And this is again an arbitrary name that refers back to the preprocessor section. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So now with the variable specified and selected, um, and uh, the, the next thing then is the, the scripts which is the actual diagnostic. Um, so in this case, it's this example diagnostic. And uh, coming back to the preprocessor, uh, we have the select January preprocessor, which is a name. And this is simply the name that is given in the preprocessor section, where we see that the select January preprocessor extracts a month, and the month that it's, it extracts is the first one. Um, the, there is a great number of preprocessors. We talked about them already a little bit. Um, but if you want to know more, have a look at the documentation there. We have a, a comprehensive description of all the uh, preprocessors. You can also look at the paper, the technical paper. Um, there we have, uh, more detailed, more scientific description of the preprocessors. Uh, however, since new preprocessors are added all the time, and the last paper describes version 2.0 of the tool, already some extensions have been made since then. OK. Um, turning to the supported data sets then, <clears throat> the general approach that we have 
is to try to frame all data in, in CMIP-like terms. So uh, what we mean by that is that we want to facilitate the comparison of uh, different data sets as well as possible. And to allow that, we want that, for example, surface temperature is always called TAS, always called TAS. And if we are looking at an observational data set that has surface temperature, but calls it something else, for example, just T or temp, then we will uh, try to summarize such a data set so that um, the data, when it is presented to the diagnostic, will also be called TAS. So we try to harmonize as much as possible uh, the different data sets that we support uh, with the CMAP standard. Where this is not possible or not practical, we do support uh, the addition of other variables via custom tables. Um, for example, when we want to include new phenomena that are not reflected yet in the CMAP standard, uh, then, then we'll do that via a custom table. The same might apply for uh, variables that are simply not available in models generally, but come from, for example, satellite observations or similar. Okay, um, so that's the general idea, the general approach to supporting data sets. Uh, specifically, we already talked a fair bit about uh, CMIP data sets and, and model data sets. In addition to that, we support uh, observational data sets <clears throat> and we distinguish uh, three tiers of observations. Tier one is uh, basically ANA for MIPS and OPS for MIPS. That is uh, observational or reanalysis data that already is in a CMAP-like form and is freely available. Tier two are other data sets that are freely available. Um, that is all kinds of data sets uh, that are made available by the observational community uh, with no restriction on distribution and usage, but that may come in any format, uh, be that CSV files or other text files, or maybe some other binary files. And we support those via uh, summarization scripts that are part of ESM2. And uh, then there's the tier three, which is restricted data sets that we support in the same way as tier two, but cannot distribute ourselves. And so uh, due to these restrictions, then it falls on the user to, uh, to download them themselves and, and reformat them using the SM Valsul facilities. I'll, I'll add the caveat here that in many cases, when you're using a shared computer, such as the aforementioned Jasmine or uh, Mistral and Levante and TRZ, um, the pre-processing of these data sets may already have happened. So um, if you're using a shared computer, you can find the tier three data sets already ready for use but it is always your responsibility to make sure that the way that you use them uh, complies with the license that you uh, have. Um, this, this is basically uh, another summary of what I just said. So let me skip ahead. Um, in an earlier version of this talk, I had here a list of all the observations, but by now this list has just grown too big with more than 75 observational data sets being supported. You can uh, find the full list in the documentation and I'm putting here a link to the specific side of the documentation. But if you go to the documentation and look for obtaining input data, you will find it there. This is also something we already briefly touched upon um, and because there were a number of questions on this, uh, maybe we'll move a bit faster here. 
basically CMIP data as it's available on ESGF can have all these kind of problems. And there's the CMIP data, uh, the CMIP errata service, which collects the knowledge of uh, existing problems in uh, data on ESGF. And we have fixes and, and fixing facilities for this in the ESML tool. Um, and this is the precise location where you can find the fixes if you're interested in looking uh, what exactly is, is being fixed there. Okay, um, since version 2.3.0, we also have added rather good support for native data sets. That is, um, since that version, uh, it's relatively easy to um, add support for things like native model output or observational data sets um, that all um, uh, that, that already are in a kind kind of somewhat close to CMIP form or things like that. So the, the most prominent example probably is ERA5, which is this huge um, reanalysis data set where it's both a bit impractical to create another copy of the data set just to change the format slightly and also unnecessary because it is already in a, in a format that is so close to what we want to present to the diagnostic that instead we added support to read this data natively as it comes from the uh, provider. Um, other examples for, for models that are supported include the IPSL climate model and uh, ICON. And there, there are a few more uh, examples already. So if you want to read and analyze native model output, that is generally much easier to do now than it was before. Okay, um, that brings me to the end of the uh, supported data set section. And in the rest of the slides, we'll just look at a few example diagnostics. That are... So let me start with a brief overview um, there are more than 75 recipes included in ESM VAR tool, and you can have a look at uh, the documentation. There is the, they are categorized into these um, seven categories. The vast, oh, well, the majority of uh, diagnostics or recipes is available for the atmospheric domain, but we also have a number of other things. I should add here the, the caveat a little bit. The IPCC report here is only listed with two recipes. That's because um, for the AR6 report, there is a large number of recipes that has been used to produce the AR6 figures, um, but that has been kept in a separate repository uh, during the preparation of the report and is being integrated uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to give you a, a glimpse at some of the diagnostics that we have. It's a somewhat random selection, I would say, of uh, recipes and diagnostics that are documented in the paper. The first one, um, are these performance metrics. This is a roundabout way of understanding how, um, how the different climate models perform uh, comparatively. Um, the, the colors here always give a comparison between the models in the different columns uh, for the different variables that are listed in the different rows. Yeah, so this is a performance metrics that is a quick roundabout way of understanding um, how uh, climate models perform in comparison. 
Uh, this, on the other hand, are this uh, is the so-called single model performance index. This is not comparative. Here, every uh, dot is calculated without any reference to, to the other ones. And the location um, gives you an idea of uh, how well it performs compared to observations and um, the size of the circles tells you something about the, the uncertainty. Here we have a, a typical uh, comparison with observations. In this case, uh, mean surface temperature versus era interim data set. Um, we see the multimodal mean and bias as well as error, two error measures. This is the surface temperature anomalies that I showed in the beginning. So we can see how since the 1970s or so, we really have a clear uh, trend upwards. This is from the uh, CMIP-5 ensemble, which is why it ends a little bit early, but a similar figure can be produced for the CMIP-6 ensemble as well. Um, yeah, uh, this is a more specialized um, diagnostic that uh, tells, tells us something about the meridional heat transport. Um, so I'll take it just as an example here as a, as a more special diagnostic uh, that people use. Um, this is uh, modes of variability, in this case, the AMO. Um, but it is also an example of how we interface with third-party packages. So in this case, we made use of the CVDP, the Climate Variability Diagnostics Package from NCAR, if I'm not mistaken, um, that analyzes these different modes of variability. And this is one example. And this shows you how you can quickly make use of uh, third-party packages to extend the functionality by using the ESM BAL tool as a preprocessor to feed these, uh, to feed the data into these packages. Um, an example for uh, ocean diagnostic, in this case, the uh, infamous AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, that, that uh, is an important measure for the so-called conveyor belt, the main ocean current system in the North Atlantic. Yeah, a, a, a quick um, analysis of the sea surface temperature as compared to observations that uh, is very useful when diagnosing your own model. This is again a um, more specialized diagnostic. Uh, here we are venturing into the domain of sea ice, looking at the so called ice formation efficiency. Um, and yeah, the, the Arctic and the Arctic sea ice is uh, an important uh, measure of, of climate change. And this is an interesting diagnostic uh, for, for the Arctic community. Uh, here we are now getting more into the carbon cycle, analyzing um, the, the flux of, of CO2. And we're staying in the kind of CO2 carbon cycle uh, um, land surface domain with a look at the ecosystem turnover time. In this case, uh, the observational, uh, the zonal distribution, again, compared to observations. Um, here we have the same, uh, the same quantity basically, but instead of looking at the zonal distribution, we are looking at uh, distribution of bias and space. Returning to the ocean and the biogeochemistry, uh, here we're looking at dissolved nitride uh, close to the surface. Comparing models uh, with the World Ocean Atlas. So you see this overall structure of comparing 
models with observations. This is a rather advanced diagnostic for the uh, dissolved nitrate, helpful in the diagnosis of um, the biogeochemistry of the ocean. Um, yeah, this is just to show, I mean, kind of coming back to this question of pressure levels versus model levels, I suppose. Here we're looking at um, these profiles with the pressure uh, resolved by seasonality and uh, looking at the bias uh, in, in the models. Yes, so uh, in summary, ESM VAL tool is an efficient tool for the evaluation of ESMs, uh, particularly for, for routine evaluation. And as an open source project is very open to contributions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, do go to the, um, to the GitHub page, open a, an issue or a, a discussion, or if you prefer, you can also find the email, uh, the mailing list on the ESM Valtzul homepage. Um, it has contributed a fair bit of analysis to the AR6 report of IPCC and uh, is now more and more used in, uh, in the model development for monitoring purposes close to the runs. And yeah, I'll... I'll...